Legends of Tabletop Podcast. Hope you all are doing well. Hey, John, how's it going? Pleasure good, to have you. Good. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for having I, I feel, me. I feel like we should have did this a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and three Necronomicons in. I'm sure we've we've crossed path a dozen times already. Oh, yeah. Probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How was your Necronomicon this year? You did at least two panels, right? Yeah, yeah. It was it was a whirlwind. It was great. Um, uh, had a fantastic time. Um, uh, both uh, Necronomicons uh, have been fantastic. Uh, I, I my first was in 2017, and then uh, this one most recently, and. Uh, um, uh, I had less time this time, you know, it, it really, it was, <clears throat> it was a crunch to try to, to fit it in um, uh, with everything else that was going on and is going on in my life. Um, but, uh, you know, I hit the ground running from the time I got in to the time that I left. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's, we've got a really remarkable, a really remarkable uh, audience and crowd of of uh, uh, of weird fiction aficionados um, and uh, writers, artists, uh, of course, uh, wonderful readers, and uh, uh, yeah, it's so it's it's kind of like it feels it always feels a little like uh surprising uh how many people uh, um seem like close friends almost immediately mm -hmm. absolutely I, I've, I've said on the show before it's you know it's a convention but it, it almost feels more like a family reunion when you get there because like everybody's there you know and like you say there's that yeah, instant absolutely. connection because we're all bonding over the same kind of weird stuff yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. It's, it's just a lot of fun. It is, it is, and uh, you know, just uh, speaking of, of conventions, just last week I um, was the the keynote speaker um, at a convention in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, hmm. the Pioneer Con, a small uh, convention, but that was really that was really nice, and uh, um, and. Uh, uh, a great time. Yeah. Is that I, also? I, I enjoy it. Yeah. Is that also like a literary style convention, or what? What's the focus for that? Yeah, one? the focus really for Pioneer Con is uh, sci-fi, fantasy, and horror. So, um, you know, and and it's and it's put on by a uh, community college, Jeff State. They started it a few years ago, and it's gotten bigger and bigger every year, and. And of course, I I grew up in Alabama. I grew up in Mobile, um, and I went to undergrad uh, in Birmingham. So I know the area very well, and uh, my writing is very influenced by place. And that whole state is, you know, as I said to them, you know the the magic and horror of Alabama. I mean, it's, it runs deep, um, yeah. positively and negatively. Right. Um, right. Uh, but, but we just got back from that a few days ago. Cool. Now, do you do a lot of cons during the year or no? You know, really, <laughs> it, it's funny. I never went to a convention until uh, Necronomicon 2017. Oh that was, wow! That, that was the my my first. Uh, so technically, Pioneer Con is the third time I've gone to a convention. Um, again, it was kind of it was kind of hit the ground running in 2017. Uh, I, I just recently had had my collection come out, and uh, and I was on a couple of panels. Um, including one big Ligotti panel, uh, which was specifically related to Thomas Ligotti and his work uh, in in 2017, and uh, I remember that was a 
<laughs> it, it wasn't what I expected. Um, I, you know, other than I think the very last uh, panel, uh, the kind of say goodbye panel for Necronomicon 2017, it it was the most packed panel that that I saw uh, the the entire convention long. We were we were on the uh, 18th floor um, uh, ballroom, um, and uh, it was packed. I mean, so it was kind of amazing to 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 see, uh, you know, an audience full of of readers and writers um, invested in and interested in, at the very least, uh, Ligotti's work. Uh, I never could have imagined something like that uh, in 20, 30 years before. Right. So things things have come a long way. That's very cool. Very cool. It, it, both years at Necronomicon, because you do um... – Grim, uh, Grim Scribe Press. Is, is it kind of a working thing for you? Or, you know, trying to make connections, you know, pitch for stories, like all that kind of stuff while you're there? Or is it more of a, I guess it's not, it's not really laid back, right? Because we're running all over the place no matter what, but. Yeah, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's funny because Necronomicon, it seems like it's, it, it's all about, it is all about connections, um, but not in a, not in a, a, a crass uh commercial way um, not like gen con <laughs> <laughs> you know i'm i i i didn't neither time that i was there did i feel pressured to uh, uh meet the right people or 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 make the right connections in order to to further my own career um uh i i i felt like there were moments of of real connection um, between myself and and uh, people I would talk to, um, you know, in the vendors' room or or uh, before and after other panels, um, and uh, as a as a panelist um, between the the other panelists and um, uh, the the audience members. Um, also, you know, it's fantastic meeting other writers uh, of of weird fiction. Right. You know, um, in, in 2017, um, Matthew and Bartlett and I met face to face in person for the first time, and you know, we just immediately clicked. And and uh, you know, an hour or two of us talking in the lobby of the Biltmore just went by like that. Um, and, uh, it's hard to describe, um, how instantaneously, uh, um, those deep kind of, of, of connections can, can be made. And so, yeah, it's, it, it's, um, it, it's a, to me, the, the greatest thing about, uh, uh, both Necronomicons was how uh, how inspiring it was to meet and talk to uh, other people interested in the same kind of things that I'm interested in, um, invested in in uh, um, their own work, um, some in my work, uh, and some mutually in work that that we both admire uh so yeah it's it's a cool thing <laughs> it really is and uh um i only wish that i had started going uh to it many years before yeah i, I missed 13 uh with stuff going on at home and then i went in 15 and i've been been every year since and it's the one thing i know when it's that's coming up for that year like that's my trip for the year. Yeah, yeah. I don't go anywhere else. I'm going to do that. Yeah, and I thought I wasn't going to be able to make it this time because of uh, time concerns with work and 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 uh, you know economically. Um, but ultimately, I just I, I I just had to make it happen. 
the the pressure was too intense <laughs> and 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 when i was and when i was offered uh, being on those two panels and moderating the 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 panel on the uncanny and dummies dolls and the like i mean i just i couldn't turn it down right. i had to go <laughs> I had to make it happen <laughs> and it was cool this year last year we missed out a lot of the guys from um you know the gaming side weren't able to make it out because they were against Gen Con, so everybody was out that way because that's you know that's the money con, that's where they're you right. know doing right. all their business and stuff. So it was great to have them back again this year, yeah, um, and be able to get to hang out. We're we're gonna have to get you out drinking with us next time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not as big of a drinker as I used to be. Ah, that's all right. <laughs> but yeah, that would be that would be great. That would be a lot. Yeah. Definitely. I, the in dark guy. So I was able to record the in darkenman panel and I, man, that room was packed for that. I, and I guess I shouldn't yeah. be surprised, right? Cause it plays to the, to the crowd and, you know, sort of the mindset of the weird fiction and all. But, you know, at one point I looked around, there's people on the floor, there's people standing, they were yeah. hanging out the doors. It's like, Holy crap. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. And, and, uh, and it was just, it was so strange talking about that subject, which, you know, among most, you know, normal people <laughs> uh, talking about nihilism as salvation in any sense, literary or otherwise, would be uh, taboo. And, and so, and I realized sometime during that panel how difficult, well, one, saying things that I'd never said out loud before and thoughts that I had had that, I, that, that um, I, I had only thought about uh, and never spoken aloud. And um, it, 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 it just, it struck me really, really uh, deeply how, how difficult the top, topic is, but also how kind of cathartic it was to, to discuss, you mm -hmm. know, without without fear of being or without much fear of being misunderstood or considered you know nihilism is the the word itself i mean what it conjures is so deeply negative and uh pejoratively i mean you know uh when we think about nihilists we think about people who who don't care about anything you know lawless right anarchy anarchy and um uh, uh complete obliviousness to uh the feelings of others and that is that is a type of nihilism for sure uh, right. but it's not the it's not the only type and there is there is the nihilism that comes and goes as well uh and that is deeply connected to mental illness uh um severe depression and and the the flip side of that uh severe anxiety um and so i think all of these things are are things that that the panelists and uh, many of the audience members most likely uh had some kind of of uh, basis and experience mm -hmm. there were definitely good uh, questions and uh, feedback from the audience as well during the panel yeah definitely I mean, we all sort of live with this existential dread, you know, pressures from society and from work and, you know, all these different things. So like, uh, you know, on some level, I think every, it hits everybody and maybe not consciously. It's just like, oh, I got to, you know, go to work. But if you, you know, kind of deep delve into it, it's not the conversation you want to have with, you know, your cube mate <laughs> necessarily. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, being able to do that at the panel, I can see being a real visceral uh, you know, thing, especially being a, a you know panelist, everybody looking up to you to like explain, like, well, what do you mean this liberation that you know, with this right. nothingness? Like, what are you talking about? Right, it, right. it's really eye opening. It was a really, really enjoyable panel. Yeah. Well, good, good. I'm glad. I, you know, I, I you know, I feel like um, uh, I was glad that I was able to to be a panelist. Uh, um, to kind of, if nothing else, then to kind of express how it felt um, as, you know, a kid in college uh, years and years ago uh, to, f 
first pick up Thomas Ligotti's Songs of a Dead Dreamer and recognize what was on the page uh, and, and feel uh, uh, this strange, ineffable kinship with the, the, the mind on the other side of those words. Uh, and the and the kind of paradoxical comfort of that, uh, uh, it it was, uh, yeah. I'm 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 really glad. And you know, Bracken McLeod did a fantastic uh, job of moderating. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, it that was the first panel I was on of the day, and then the second panel was was the panel that I moderated. And you know, I I really tried to. Uh, emulate his his uh kind of command of of uh the room and and uh um the facilitation uh just uh, seemingly effortless on his part uh of going from question to question i mean he really balanced things beautifully and i think all of the panelists just were were fantastic yeah everybody had good personal stories to relate or you know involved with the with the subject matter you know nobody dropped the ball like it was it was totally on point yeah yeah and and, and it felt like the audience was very much you know a part of the panel as well uh and um you know very uh, i mean it was rather surprising to me given the subject i was i was thinking at times, boy, you know, we're gonna we're gonna start losing some people, um, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I was expecting like not mass walkouts, but I wouldn't have been surprised if a quarter of the audience had had walked out at certain points, um, and that didn't happen. Yeah, yeah, so. definitely. And it was early. It was well, it was relatively early. I think it was like a ten or a ten thirty panel, so yeah. it was it was a fairly well, early commitment. It was, yeah, yeah, for 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 that convention especially, you know, it's it's really difficult to go to sleep uh, before one o'clock in the morning, um, yeah, or, or or later, which you you know, back in the old days wouldn't have been that big of a deal, but for us pushing fifty you now and. <laughs> And beyond it, it's not it's not the same just not the same as it used to be <laughs> it it was rough i i was so looking forward to going mm -hmm. and on the other other side i was like man i'm gonna be so tired and so <laughs> over yeah 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 uh -huh. i'm used to going to bed at a certain time i get up at a certain time <laughs> yeah well, it was it was really strange because you know i had um I flew in that Friday and uh, and I got in in the evening, like around five or six, I think, and drove straight to uh, the the convention, uh, went to the new weird panel, uh, mm -hmm. straight to it. And then straight after that, uh, went to a, a, a room party in, in Matt Bartlett's room um, where he and I uh, read one of our collaborative stories that's coming out next month. Cool. Um, uh, the the fielding the Latham fielding liaison. I almost said fielding liaison. <laughs> um, but uh, um, and then of course you know that that story took probably an hour or more to read. So. Mm. Um, uh, we were fortunate that that the audience was patient enough to sit through the whole thing um that quietly you know with with uh, a room full of you know people wanting to to drink and talk and right, right. <laughs> uh so uh so that was that was tiring in and of itself uh, but then the next day it was a panel uh in the morning straight into uh, another reading, um, then straight into another panel, uh, 
and then that evening I, I read again, <laughs> I read uh, uh, Matt Carden's story uh, from his new collection, which is amazing, um, uh, to rouse Leviathan. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that, that was a, that was a full time and that doesn't, you know, that, uh, that doesn't include dinners, lunches, stuff like that. And all of the, yeah. the, the side, um, um, conversations, uh, and, and that, that seemed to be such an important part of these things. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, the next day was, uh, uh, you know, relatively easy signing and, and, uh, uh, and that may have been actually the, that Sunday may have been my favorite time because it, I, I, I did have time to, you know, really talk at length with, with, uh, friends and acquaintances, uh, that I'd wanted to talk to for a long time. Um, it never seems like there's enough of that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you definitely have to make choices while you're there. Like I don't do any gaming there ever. Mm -hmm. Um, just cause it eats up so much time. Sure. And you know, I, I, I try to record panels cause that's kind of work and, you know, we'll have not everybody can get to everything. So maybe I can grab something that, you know, people are interested in. Yeah. That's um, great. But yeah. The whole rest of the time, it's just, it's the people like, it's just hanging out. It's just, you know, having that contact, even as an introvert, like everybody's there, you know, there's people from the UK, there's people from, you know, all over the States, there's people from Canada, like we're all together. Like you got to get it in. Yeah. Yeah. And, and as a fellow introvert, I know exactly what you mean. It, it's a little overload at times, but like yes. you, you just, you're in with both feet and you just try to recover when you get back. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that though, about, being an introvert, um, uh, one of the big differences between most social occasions beyond people I know very well um, and, um, and the Necronomicon is that it's a lot easier <laughs> than yeah. usual, you know, I mean, uh, uh, I, I've I've lived my life mostly um, being the guy who, if it's if 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 it's a party full of mostly strangers, then I'm going to fade into the the background mm -hmm. uh, and stick to a couch somewhere and maybe talk to one or two people. Right. Um, but uh, at the Necronomicon, it's just person after person connection after connection there's there's too there's too much um yeah. <laughs> but it's it, it, it's it's a it's a joy it really is well you know you have that commonality to start right like i said earlier we're all coming together for the same thing so it, it, it sort of facilitates that or you know maybe you know someone in passing but you've never met before or whatever that's right. you know when we started the podcast i used to dread coming on and doing interviews because like oh, i don't want to talk like this was stupid <laughs> whose idea was this is the dumbest right, thing right, in the world right. but then you know you do it for a little bit and you kind of get habituated and you could have you know sort of break that down and it's like oh wait well like we have a thing in common either weird fiction or gaming or you know the tabletop stuff or whatever like you instantly have some connection already anyway and absolutely. it just absolutely kind of slide right in and yep, yep. do the thing so yeah uh, and and uh, and for me, you know, uh, funnily enough, I've, I've got a theater background, you know, I started, I started acting when I was six years old and wow. continued doing it for a very long time. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, uh, into my adulthood. Um, and, uh, so I guess in a way it makes, it may, it, it makes, um, uh, things like, being on a panel uh or or even getting interviewed easier um just because walking on a stage uh full of people <laughs> and performing at, you know it's it 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 never it never is not terrifying at some point yeah. right <laughs> so it kind of inured me um uh to to uh 
public speaking of sort. <laughs> right, right. So let's circle back around. Yeah. How did you first get involved? What was sort of your introduction into weird fiction? How, how did you get sucked into this? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I can't. Uh, um, I can't talk about this subject without uh, mentioning uh, my older brother, uh, who um, who spent uh, an enormous amount of time. <laughs> Uh, uh, trying to scare me uh, when we were kids, uh, and, and and was incredibly imaginative. Uh, in fact, sometimes I think you know uh, he's a businessman, but he could easily have a career um, as, as a horror writer because uh, <laughs> boy, he he would really improvise some some uh, scary stories every night before bed, um, and of course he knew that I was scared of dolls and I, mm. I've talked about my, my childhood fear of dolls at, at great length. Um, but, uh, long story short, uh, you remember the, the night gallery, um, uh, Rod Serling and, mm. uh, there's an episode called the doll, uh, which is an adaptation of an Algernon Blackwood story. And I saw, uh, that episode when I was four years old, Oof. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, <laughs> um, up late at night, as I shouldn't have been, and uh, that will teach you. <laughs> yeah, it really did, and uh, it it scared me so badly. I I had nightmares about this thing uh, almost every night, um, mm -hmm. and I mean, combined with night terrors, you know, paralysis. I mean, it, it was it was it was really really horrible. So, you know, while I was I, I, I was going through this almost every night, my brother was, you know, telling me these horrible uh, improvised stories about the, you know, disembodied hand under my bed, um, <laughs> the, the uh, you know, and I, I actually, one of my stories uh, is, is somewhat autobiographical, um, uh, about two brothers, but, uh, you know, he, he, uh, had me convinced that my parents had had another child before, right before I was born who died, um, uh, young and, um, who they didn't talk about named Sam and that Sam was talking to my, my brother told me that Sam was talking to him every, every day and telling him, to kill me oh, so that so that he could take over my disembodied my, my, you know, my vacated corpse and uh animate it um so that that was for longest time that was that was my chief terror so once <laughs> i got to be about eight or nine i i i um i don't remember i don't remember how but uh, I came upon uh, a copy in our house of um, Edgar Allan Poe's Tales of Mystery and the Imagination, and, uh, and and then I was, you know, I was set off um, on on my my course. <laughs> um, right. And uh, yeah, and you know, at the same time, I I, I started playing uh, Dungeons and Dragons like when I was, you know very young, like seven years old back in 77. And, 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 and I, and I played role-playing games, um, uh, for, for many years after that. And, uh, um, uh, so that kind of that, I mean, I remember, I remember obsessing over, uh, the monster manual, the, the 1979, you know, second edition monster manual and, and, uh, um, and and I was, I was obsessed with um, uh, the section on on the underworld and and the devils, the different types of devils and demons, and uh, um, which, which I'm sure if I had told anyone at the time, they would have uh, uh, not been surprised <laughs> that everybody was talking about Satanism and and the like um, back then. It, it, 
uh, with D and D, but uh, I, that that really that that game really nurtured kind of um, my affection for and uh, to a certain extent affinity with monsters. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and after that, of course, at some point um, in my early teen years, uh, I started reading. Uh, Stephen King. I was I was very into Michael Moorcock, uh, 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 the Elric, um, and all of the uh, Corum, all all of the Eternal Champion stuff, Hawk Moon, um, and uh, uh, from and from there, uh, I guess when I was about fifteen, I fell upon uh, the work of H.P. Lovecraft. And uh, and that really that really uh, uh, made a huge impact on me uh, at the time. Um, I, I had always tried to write, um, even even as a little kid. Um, I remember I, but but all of my efforts were were really abortive efforts. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I never really finished anything um, other than terrible po poetry. Um, and then by the time I was about 20, 21 years old, um, no, I was definitely 19 or 20. Uh, that's when I, I came upon uh, Ligotti's Songs of a Dead Dreamer. And once I read that, I knew that I wanted to write. I wanted to uh, I wanted to write like that, right. um, and uh, uh, and I, I I I slowly started trying and wrote my first story, um, which was called Eyes of the Master, and uh, uh, I thought it was absolutely brilliant. You know, I thought it was the uh, the masterpiece of the late twentieth century, and uh, uh, my uh, I uh, <laughs> slowly um, uh, thanks first to my then girlfriend, now spouse, uh, Carolyn. Um, I slowly began to realize that maybe. Not only maybe wasn't it the masterpiece of the late twentieth century, but it was in fact lousy. And, uh, um, I mean, not that she told me that in so many words, but it it, it started becoming clear, and uh, uh, and and I really stuck to that story for for a couple of years. I sent it out extensively. I got a. I got a rejection letter, I think from, for some reason I was sending it out to, to regular literary magazines. And uh, I, I got, I remember I got a, a, a rejection letter um, from the editor of Gulf Coast saying that the first paragraph of my story was the worst, most overwritten paragraph he had ever read. <laughs> <laughs> and uh so yeah i was getting i was getting little indications and then uh and then later on this is the story that i that that would drive me crazy for the next almost 20 years um that would eventually become 20 simple steps to ventriloquism mm -hmm. um and that uh you know i i uh, um i learned how to write um writing and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting um uh so yeah it was many years it was very strange you know back in uh, i guess it was 2013 when the thing first became published uh in the grim scribes puppets um it was very strange ha having something out there uh for so many years only a handful of people had had even seen anything that i had written um and, and uh and mostly that was in process right, right. 
and at various stages of not good. Um, but uh, yeah, so it it happened really fast after that. Um, most mostly, uh, I I spent the past twenty five years trying to, you know, one of my major as as strange as this sounds, one of my one of my major the major goals of my adult life has been to um, promote the work of of Thomas Ligotti because when when I first became familiar with his work and was utterly blown away by it, instantly my favorite uh, writer ever, alive or dead. Um, back then, I, I didn't. I didn't know anybody who had read his work. And even when I, even when the internet became a thing and I got online, even then it was finding people who had actually read his work, they were few and far between. So, um, you know, that's, that's where the whole idea of Thomas Ligotti online, uh, the website came about. And, and now it's 21, 22 years old, uh, so um which in internet time is forever for ages <laughs> <laughs> and uh and you know and i'm i'm it, it's it's very gratifying to to see that that how how far um his work has come in terms of being read by a wider audience um because you know tom always said uh, i'm I'm only ever going to be read by a small audience. And, you know, to some extent that's that's still true. But I mean, when you've got a, when you're one of 10 living authors who's been published by Penguin Classics um, in, in, you know, a big, lush, mega uh, uh, mass market um, uh, book, then, you know, <laughs> somebody's paying attention right right and uh uh so that's what i'm really that's what i'm really most proud of i think um is is helping his helping his work get out there uh cool. and, and everything that's happened with my work has just been kind of a side effect uh, right right uh, of 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 that initial desire of of, of seeing a, a legati story and wanting to and and saying to myself I want to be able to express these deep, weird, hidden things um, in a powerful way, um, and uh, and you know, when I started, it was it was just it was garbage, but it was it was Legati pastiche, basically, right? <laughs> a combination of uh, Legati and Poe, um, and now. You know, after all this time as a writer, I feel like I've I've got a long way to go, um, but I I have found my voice, um, and it's it's it is what it is. You know, it's not it, uh, but but it's mine. Right, right. Your interpretation of yeah. I mean, because we draw these influences from all over, so it, right. it, it's you know through the medium of you or whoever's doing the writing or the acting or the you know shooting a you know directing a movie you know you can see all those different things and kind of how they coalesce and are expanded back out again you know th through our own interpretations absolutely yeah uh, when when did you so when did, did tom begin to like take take notice of what you were doing like when when did your relationship start to develop then yeah so so i was i was very fortunate um when uh in about i was in my mid 20s um when i moved to new york city and i i moved to new york city to be with my then girlfriend uh now spouse um and uh i got a job at a corporate law firm uh, in Manhattan, in, in on the twenty third floor of uh, Thirty Rock, and mm -hmm. uh, um, it didn't pay much. It was in the law library, 
uh, I had some library experience and uh, uh, I was, you know, from Alabama and naive and, and, uh, um, and I made the mistake of answering their question when they asked me how much I would work for. <laughs> Uh, and, and, you know, when I told them, they immediately hired me. Um, but the good thing about that job was that it was very low demand. Mm -hmm. And that's when I uh, started. Well, first, I, I began to uh, become aware of, you know, I went searching for other Ligotti readers. So uh, I... I uh, got on the Usenet for the first time. Hmm. This was probably '97, and um, uh, and I started talking about uh, um, Thomas Ligotti, and uh, there were some people on the on the news on the alt horror Cthulhu news group who had read him, and there were some on the alt books uh, ghost stories <laughs> uh, group who had read him. Um, and I was very enthusiastic uh, and energetic uh, back then. And, uh, and I floated the idea to those groups of uh, creating a, a, a news group um, all about Thomas Ligotti. And everybody, everybody I talked to said, that's a bad idea. You know, it's not, uh, nobody's going to be on it. Um, he's, he's like a very small, tiny niche writer. Um, it's a waste of time. It's a waste of, of storage space. Don't do it. Well, I did it anyway. <laughs> and, um, the, the, the one other person who, uh, supported me was a guy that I met, um, I think on Alt Horror Cthulhu by the name of Matt Carden. And, uh, and he also, uh, he had he had only read at the time he had only read one uh collection by Ligotti uh Grimscrug, um but he loved it and and this guy you know Matt has a huge brain um uh, which I I realized almost immediately as we would have conversations and uh and uh in these conversations he we you know some of these threads i mean for the longest time once i created the alt books thomas ligotti it was just me and matt talking about <laughs> ligotti's work on and on right. you know and i would write a little something and uh feeling pretty good about myself i had just gotten a master's degree in english literature and then and then he would come back with this you know almost immediately with this you know 2500 word essay uh, i mean just concocted out of nowhere just brilliant insights um so we went back and forth with that for a while and then um and, and we actually did start getting uh, uh legati readers for a while there but i realized that what i really wanted to do was create a website so that's when i i i went I remember I went to a William Faulkner uh, website and I didn't know anything about creating a website or HTML. And I right. just kind of taught myself, uh, use, like kind of stealing the code of that and changing it around. And uh, um, uh, I got some web space uh, from a friend and, uh, and then put it up. And somewhere in, in there and doing all of this and being very enthusiastic about it and spending way too much time, I'm sure, um, <laughs> at work doing it. Uh, I, I realized for the first time that, um, that Ligotti worked at the time, uh, at a company called, uh, the Gale group, at least, uh, at, at the time, I think it was just Gale. And, um, and and so I did some some research, and, and mind you, all this time I was also doing tons of research for this corporate law firm, who mm -hmm. I think I think they were representing R.J. Reynolds at the time. <laughs> I was trying, I was I was doing research for these these attorneys who were trying to find 
these, you know, quack studies on like, well, cigarettes really aren't all that bad for you. So I was feeling pretty crappy about myself uh, uh, <laughs> in, in my day job. And, and I didn't begrudge, you know, uh, using their, their time for, right. for, for, uh, something that was much less, uh, horrible. Um, so I guessed Ligotti's email address and I sent him a long email, not expecting anything except maybe, a you know, please do not write me again. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get um, this? <laughs> but instead, uh, after probably about an hour, I received a very gracious, uh, kind and funny message back from him. And it turns out that he had been watching my efforts online the whole time. Uh, oh, wow. In the news group as I was like singing his praises and, you know, and so uh, we started, we started corresponding by email uh, um you know, exchanged some letters, started talking on the phone some and, uh, and becoming friends. And, uh, and somewhere down the line, I got up the courage to send him uh, the story that I, that I was already starting to realize was bad. And, uh, and he was, he was polite about it, but I knew, you know, that he wasn't impressed. Mm -hmm. And at some point I told him, you know, I'd really want this to be good. So take the kids' gloves off, you know, just give it to me. <laughs> and, and he did. And, and, and as, as great a guy as Tom is, he, um, he's, he's very serious about the craft. And I mean, because the guy, you know, spent decades, you know, honing his craft um and, and doing incredible uh research and and throwing away everything that he wrote practically uh for the longest time in the 70s um and early 80s and uh so so he he told me in no uncertain terms you know you you don't know how to write yet you know you're you're not you're not ready this is this is what works these, you know, couple of lines and, you know, this other stuff's just not, not very good. Um, and, and, and here's why. And, uh, so this, this continued for years and, uh, um, uh, and obviously, I mean, I'm eternally grateful to him for, for being so, uh, patient, um, when practically anybody else in his position would have been like, look, you know, move on to somebody else. <laughs> right. I, I've, I've had enough of this. Um, but, uh, you know, um, slowly, very slowly, because I mean, I, I would, I would think, okay, this time I'm done with it. I'm not very good at this. Um, so I'm just going to set it aside um then some months would pass and i would come up with an idea and i would go for it again and you know kind of push it his way at some point and get his his feedback and slowly um uh i got to where i needed to get in terms of what the story was about and uh and then was the hard part of actually learning how to write a decent right. story of any kind and uh um, so that's, that's, that was my trajectory, you know, my, uh, I've, I've said this many times before, but my one goal was to, was to write one decent story. And then after that, I'd be fine. You know, I, I always, right. I, my, my dream was always to write this one really good story and, and get it published by, by, uh, weird fiction, you know? which by the time I got finished with it was having its own issues. Um, and, and really by then, uh, I had an opportunity to, um, uh, to publish it, um, possibly, um, in a Ligotti themed anthology, which is exactly, uh, what I did. Nice. Yeah. So the rest was 
then I realized that there was a lot more uh, that I wanted to to write. Um, uh, partially because I had I had to cut so much of that story, you know, at its height when it was ready. And when Tom said, you know, this looks ready now, it was around 14, 15,000 words. Yeah. And I had to get it down below 5,000 words Oof. Uh, to fit in the, in the anthology. Right, uh, right. I got it down to 4,500 words. I literally cut all of the characters and stripped out the plot. <laughs> and, and then I realized this is this is right. This is this is it. This is right. Uh, but I still had that story, you know, that I wanted to 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 write. And uh, so I I kind of uh, started writing a a sort of sequel to this story that wasn't even in existence anymore. And uh, then more stories started popping up, you know all existing in this same little place, um, which I realized at some point was kind of a dreamscape version, mostly of the town that I grew up in, Mobile, mm -hmm. Alabama. Okay, interesting. And is that the first collection? Yeah. Is that, yeah. Secret of okay. Controlism, yeah. And they're all um, tied together? Is it loosely tied together? Are they all kind of... Yeah, they're they 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 are the as as it goes along, the the connection between them gets stronger, uh, but it is but it is uh, uh, loose. Um, there's really there are really only mm, what you could arguably say that there are, are four stories that that have some characters in common um with each other but in some cases that's very peripheral um uh but yeah i i mean it it's kind of, it it's a bit of a I, I didn't set out to do this but it's a bit of a hybrid novel um uh which is not my description but uh other others description yeah <laughs> Interesting, but and it's and it's weird, right? Because sometimes you'll you'll start with an idea and you have a story in mind, and you know you'll write it and realize it's not really the story that you were trying to tell. Yeah, you go back and go through the editing, and go, okay, well, this is not. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, yeah. and you know, it. I, I I'm really grateful because, um, that whole process of of uh you know, writing the book and, and then working with the, the uh, small uh, publisher, uh, Dunham's Manor Press and Jordan Crawl, the editor, um, in in putting that book together. Uh, and he was so patient. I mean, just draft after draft after draft, you know, I was, I was, I was so, uh, I was so anal about this thing, uh, just being just right. And of course, uh, it ended up having, you know, a few uh, typos anyway, and um, mm -hmm. these things happen. But uh, um, you know, he even let me uh, uh, slip in a a, a, a story um, after the, the the advanced reading copies were printed, um, because I realized. I, I wrote a story all at once. It was amazing. You know, it took me 20 years for one. And then I, <laughs> I, I wrote one in like two days and, uh, and, 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 and it was the end of the book and I knew it. Um, but anyway, this whole process, you know, and, and then after, you know, the, for, for a little, for a little weird fiction collection by, by a small press, it, it did very well. And, uh, um and um but by the end of that year after it came out i was just i was so sick of 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 myself <laughs> and, and and of all of the promotion and all about me you know me my yeah, book, yeah. my book my book and uh um and so at the same time that this was happening uh, Matt Carden and, and a few other folks and I had been planning uh, 
a literary magazine with kind of a focus on Ligottian work, um, both fiction, essays, poetry, um, art, um, uh, really with a special concentration at the time on nonfiction. And uh, uh, we had written bylaws and really, you know, set, set, sent out um, um, calls for submission and gotten some really incredible work. I mean, just like, and, and at the time we were paying, we were paying like one cent a minute. I mean, one cent a word. Yeah. And, uh, um, um, and so that turned out to be just a marvelous thing. Um, uh, and, and the magazine is done, uh, very, very well. Uh, we had a, a, a successful Kickstarter a couple of years back and, uh, which allowed us to really have a good foundation, uh, wonderful readership. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty much self, uh, pays for itself now. Um, and uh um and people are are it, it's it's it feels good to to promote the work of others <laughs> um and that's something that that i've i've discovered that i really love and i love editing um and and publishing this thing and now of course um uh the wonderful thing is that uh, uh we're moving into books now so Oh, nice. Um, uh, we're publishing a novella by Nicole Cushing, um, which is a wonderful, met hilarious and incredibly horrific uh, um, uh, piece uh, called The Half Freaks. And, uh, and she's, she's fantastic. Uh, the deluxe edition of that uh, with uh, color illustrations by Harry O. Morris, that's coming out um next week and then a couple of weeks after that um um the regular editions uh will be uh out and then uh early next year we're putting out our first collection uh by christopher slatsky it's a it's a book called the immeasurable corpse of nature and this thing i mean it's going to be one of one of the best books of the year um it's i i mean it's extraordinary <laughs> and, and and christopher's uh um christopher's stuff is just amazing um and he's a he's somebody that not many people know about yet <laughs> and I, i'm i'm making it my job to to change that it's already gotten some pretty stellar reviews um, and that's going to continue, I'm sure. Cool. Very cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with the name. I did see it on, on your Facebook yeah, yeah. promotion there, but yeah, it wasn't not something that rung a bell. Yeah, no, it's it, it's it's marvelous. It's marvelous work. It's it's it kind of if you can imagine something that kind of takes takes a, a space somewhere between uh, Ligotti's work and Laird Barron's work. Uh, um, so there's there's a very very uh, huge sense of 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 the cosmic, um, as well as uh, um, a very intimate sense of existential horror. <laughs> it's uh, it's but it's its own thing. It's it's uh, it's going to be something else. But I'm gonna I'm gonna have to to run now. Um, ah, okay. Yep. Uh, no worries. But I I, I really uh, thank you, John, uh, for having me on, uh, uh, and uh, I I hope that we get a chance to hang out at the next Necronomicon at least. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, we'll definitely have to have you come on again. I still have like a page of questions we didn't uh, even get. To. <laughs> yeah. I I went on and on. I know. No, it's good. It makes it easy for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John. Well, you take care. Right, thanks a lot. You too, John. It's a pleasure having you on. All right. Thanks. Bye. Awesome. See ya.
All right, everybody. We hope you enjoyed that. I uh, want to remind you that we do have our sponsor, Birds of a Feather Coffee. They're a small batch craft coffee roaster. Uh, you can get the legendary brew. It's a nice medium roast. Uh, there's a link for that on the show notes. You can also uh, purchase the other, um, I was going to say Legends Brews, uh, the other Birds of a Feather Coffee Brews. They have the Night Owl Blend, which is a fantastic dark roast. Uh, they have the Morning Lark and the Hummingbird, one of which is a decaf. I don't remember which. Uh, but if you use the code legends 10, you're going to get 10% off your order and shipping is always free. I suggest you order two bags at a time because you can fit two ba- two uh, coffee bags in a mailer. It's a little bit cheaper for Neil, but do as you wish. I always order two. I actually just got an order in and I was almost completely out. So I'm super stoked to have some coffee in again. Um, this uh, interview will be released next week. Although if you've listened to this whole thing, I guess you probably don't care already because you already did. And I'll probably cut this out, but it'll be released next week. Uh, I want to thank everybody for checking this out. We appreciate everybody who tunes in and listens, leaves reviews, does all that stuff. A uh, special shout out to Robin Chang. Uh, they've been leaving uh, awesome comments and uh, feedback and stuff on the YouTube videos. Uh, so thank you for that. I totally appreciate it. And uh, we'll catch you all next time.